Mr. Darpinian, this is what I'd prefer starting our discussion with. There have been some statements by who I'm going to recite right now, and this is what you've said. Any emergency contains the potential for future more expedient, faster development. So uh, where is that potential today? Where can we search for it? Thank you, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. Well, apparently I must tell the audience first that we're old friends and uh, I would prefer talking to one another in you singular rather than plural, of course. So uh, you see, there is this theory, of the, the crisis theory, the theory of emergencies and it is common to say that crisis contain the potential of rebirth, uh, but there are different crises in the world. And uh, if it is natural, if it's a disaster, it's very difficult to revitalize the body, the spirit that has been gradually deteriorating here. It's, it's a moral deterioration, it's a frustration, and it, uh, it is, it's very difficult to find the potential to development in such a situation. However, the answer to your question is among the people, is in the Armenian people, in the Armenian culture, in the history of Armenia in the dignity of the Armenian people, you understand. So nevertheless, we've come through millennia. As an ethnic group, we have deserved the right to survive, the, to leave. And uh, there have been numerous ethnic groups that were fully eliminated, but uh, we proved that we were able we were able to revive, uh, to survive, to, to find success in other systems and, and significant success. Uh, just one second to interrupt you. To tell you that all this means that the 44 day war for us was a war, it was a struggle of survival. We, because after the war, we spoke of existence of this nation, did we? Well, it was not a war of survival because it was not our choice, first of all. I would say, well, frankly, I would even refrain from the word war. This was more a battle, a struggle, not a war. Uh, I wouldn't say we lost. I wouldn't say we have lost completely. Uh, it was a battle just as it was uh, in in the beginning of the 90s and we won that time and Azerbaijan has always said that it was not a war it was not a defeat for them either they were going to come back and they came so if we think that we have lost the war and there are no chances to restore the dignity then essentially we're programming our future failure already by saying so we must look at it as follows. It's an opportunity to further augment our prudence, capacity, skills. Well, if some people think that there is peace established and that peace is established on the sake of our national dignity, I don't think it can be a long lasting peace. It can be long lasting only when the dignity is not damaged. You can lose a battle and uh, many very powerful leaders lost battles, but you cannot establish peace for the sake of dignity. That may never last for a long time. So we should strive for a long-term peace apparently, but there is only one path towards it. 
we have to be able to restore our dignity. The previous question was, uh, we, we did not finish. Yes, the previous question. Let me read it through again. Any crisis contains the potential for a faster development in the future. That's what you've said. Yes, I have. And where is that potential now and where can we search for it? Well, I think restoring dignity is in fact the capacity that contains the key to the future. And we will definitely restore. We will survive because going back to these words, like war, for example, I cannot call it a defeat when during the battles of September, October, November 2020, there were numerous heroic deeds of our soldiers, very strong, memorable. And if we compare that to the Second World War, then I might say there have been more heroic episodes in the history of the Armenian nation. So uh, I may never even call it a defeat. Yes, we were not ready. It's us to blame for sure. We have to bear the bitterness of those mistakes, but we have to understand that uh, the potential for becoming stronger is in restoring dignity. And of course, there are very many students of yours among those heroes, where are they? Yes. I prefer keeping them in the times of peace so that they could use their potential to develop our country. Many lost their lives, many were injured, many became disabled, many returned slightly with some distorted perceptions, uh, confused, asking questions, why were we not ready, etc. So, I mean, uh, that there have to be answers to these questions and the future generation will demand answers to these questions for sure. The, the state is obliged to find such answers. But this generation is a winning generation, and I believe in it. Okay, so uh, when building the future, we must demand answers to those questions, am I right? Yes, but it's more important to have a vision. Because if we're looking back, digging into the past, uh, there may be not enough time to think about the future to concentrate on future building activity. Okay, by saying we, you mean the society as the society, of course. So, I mean, the society that bears the responsibility, the collective responsibility for its own future. You see, it seems like we're not accustomed to that way of thinking historically. We've been always giving importance to education as a nation, but we've also given importance to education, to education for our children, for the personal successes they can get in the future. We never thought of collective success. We never thought of success of a nation. Anyone who gets education, especially good quality education, naturally strives for personal success, career and professional development. So we should also raise the issue of collective success collective achievements. So education should not only be viewed as a personal success, but we should have educated society that might demand effective nation in the future. We don't have it today. So that personal achievement in education or due to education is viewed differently. I've been seeing many such approaches when personal successes are uh, viewed in having a diploma that allows for having better marriage, for example. So that personal success is viewed quite differently 
and ultimately it results in problems in the university education because if you get university education to uh, uh, have a better husband or a wife that well it's not it's not a bad thing either yes it's a very good thing well i wouldn't like to bring it down uh, to such a level of uh, pragmatism but i think that uh, every parent this way or another considers all possible benefits of getting proper education naturally the in all other equal conditions and in, in developing or developed societies education is a is a factor that may have influence on the choice of men or women uh, but many societies in yesterday's in today's in tomorrow's worlds will value um, partners that have less education so the less sorry there are societies that give more value to less educated women for example and the opposite uh, i might suppose can be here in armenia i'm i feel truly piteous about that but i mean we should not be talking about that we are now talking about educated societies and we can clearly see and uh, we still harvest the yields of uh, not proper education and our failures our defeat the situation in which we are now uh, definitely preconditioned not ultimately by this circumstance but with that as well okay so you mean restore dignity and think about the uh, collective benefits of education Doubtlessly, a state must be based on culture, national uh, act, traditions, culture, values, and uh, we we have a very rich legacy, and uh, we've been wasting it so disgracefully, uh, forgetting, not taking care of, not giving importance to the, the culture. The pivot of which is what should the state and the society be gravitating around so, uh, so that we're interesting for the world. Otherwise, we're not. We're of no interest for the world. We are a very egocentric society. Uh, and it seems to us that our problems, our issues are of interest for for the world i can assure you no one's interested moreover uh, they are repulsive if you go there with problems with your pain it's, it's not of interest to anyone you become repulsive for them but the success story is attractive they can get attracted to the identity to success to our unique approaches to the development issues of ours some models that might be of significance some value maybe for the whole world maybe for some countries in the world to to follow to to understand how armenians created their success that's what we have to try to establish these islands of success okay islands small islands of success that might further join into an archipelago yeah that's how what i see that's that's what that's how i see it yes a, a strong nation is established through such small successes uh, scattered initially but then consolidated because you know, free uh, mind and uh, and opportunities and and freedoms uh, and uh, the possibility to make use of available resources uh, optimal use of resources which resources are we talking about well information for example um, either you are in uh, downtown Yerevan or in a, a bordering village, you must have the same access to resources. You must have the same access to information flows. Okay, uh, it is the case. I've been in many villages where there is no even gas supply, but there is internet connection. Well, it's great there is no gas supply, by the way. We are the most, uh, we're the country that has uh, gas supply in almost all of its communities be becoming 
uh, one of the few in the whole world. That's 95, 94, 95 percent of the territory. Uh, and that definitely results in a higher tariff for the gas. I mean, there were communities which definitely did not need gas that much, um, could definitely uh, get along without gas, and, and uh, the country would definitely have a lower tariff. So, but you mentioned the internet connection. Yes. But apart from internet, there is also a possibility for developing infrastructure roads, more importantly, access to benefits, to opportunities, cultural sites, etc. I mean, people were born to live cultural, social life, and there has to be such possibility established by the state for enjoying that life. Every village has to create that opportunity and the state should create the opportunity for the culture to be born in every village. As it, in, it happened in the village Jajur. Yes, it happened when, when it was Soviet Union yet. And uh, all of us, no, not all of us, but at least our generation is the Soviet generation. So I think uh, Soviet Armenian is a winning Armenian. The victorious Armenian, because we have significant successes in culture, in dignity. When speaking of Soviet, yes, people remember uh, uh, repressions, Stalinism, injustice, unfairness, the legacy of Bolsheviks, but they forget about the legacy of a developed socialistic state that the Armenian culture created in that environment. We had uh, quite noticeable developments there. Yes, but there is a different issue here because investments in the Armenian economy at the time and in Armenian culture also came from abroad at the time. They came from the, the Soviet Union. I mean, Soviet Union invested in the Armenian economy. Yes, it did. And uh, you see, Armenians were the winners in the Soviet Union. We were perceived as a successful nation in the Soviet Union. I think in the first war of Karabakh in the beginning of the 90s, we won just because we were also Soviet Armenians at the time. We, we created, we generated enormous cultural legacy those years. And I think we did not We did not, we, we took it for granted. We did not really value what we got there. We almost, almost forgot the Soviet Armenian legacy. Almost uh, forgot the Eastern, the Western Armenian legacy, but essentially we solved no problems there. Who was there to present the valuable legacy of Western Armenia, who were going to translate those into French, Armenian, Russian, Eastern Armenian, I mean. So, well, uh, we even took the opposite direction because Western Armenian is in quite a hideous condition now. And that condition occurs because the Eastern Armenian applies pressure upon it. No, I don't think there's any pressure. But there's just an ideological approach. I mean, it has to be observed conceptually as a phenomenon. The Western Armenian, Eastern Armenian. I don't think Eastern Armenian applied any pressure upon the Western Armenian. Simply, there's no vision. We don't understand how we're going to look at it. The state, the Armenian state, should take care of the Armenian uh, legacy, uh, the Western Armenian legacy. If not the Armenian state per se, then who is going to do that? Okay, Krikorians can on their own defend and, and Gil Penkians can do that, yes, protect that legacy somehow, but it is the Armenian state that pursues its mission in uh, development of the Armenian culture and, and raising the value in, and the, the Armenian state has done nothing in that respect. 
at least for the uh, Western Armenian. So I should say there has to be a theater in Western Armenian operating in Yerevan. There have to be films produced in Western Armenian every year. There have to be translations of that uh, literature we have there to present it to the world. Uh, well, uh, we don't even do the, the Eastern Armenian part of it, not to say the Western, uh, why I smiled, because there is this film, Tajvajik, made in Western Armenian, by the way. Yes, but it has to be, uh, it has to come from a general goal. I mean, the diaspora should become part of uh, further development of the state. What have we done for the diaspora? We haven't done a lot. We only asked and demanded. Yes. Uh, for money and also gave them the opportunity to buy apartments in the center of Yerevan. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's not what we expect to, to see. Well, there is a lot to do. It's just a huge volume of work that has to be done. We've been losing time only been wasting opportunities, 30 years, almost half of the Soviet time of the Soviet Armenia period, half of our lives ultimately. I mean, we've lost several generations uh, in that respect, several generations of those who could have developed the state, who could have made the state stronger. Unfortunately, um, that's the situation. And we should start conversing these ideas. Coming back to your question of the potential. The potential is that we came to zero in 30 years. And uh, from zero, you always go up. That's how it works. There is this English expression. It can only get better, they say. Well, unfortunately, well, maybe we're, we're not even the break even. I mean, there is the possibility to go worse and worse. So there is a potential, there is a p possibility. Uh, there is a possibility of uh, being worse than this because we have yet not understood the priorities as a nation. You know, there is this concept of a political nation and a political nation, a nation that understands that the state is the priority. The state interest, the public interest is above everybody else's, I mean, of, of the individuals. So that's, that's in the immune system. It's usually custom to say that um, political nations are the empires, politicized societies, uh, considering the interests of an empire higher than the well-being of an individual. But there are smaller nations that also understand that, and Israel is one of the best examples of such uh, perception. And they understand the interest of the nation prevailing over individual individuals. We prevail uh, with our individual interests. So we, and uh, we are on the verge of destruction of our nation. So uh, there is, there, there are no other words to describe the situation I can see right now. Okay, so the fact that we put our individual interests above the ones of the nation is not related to the absence of statehood, is it? Well, it is, of course it is. I said that as an ethnic group, we have proven the right to existence, because we're still here. We did not perish. Maybe due to the cultural, uh, spiritual legacies, we, we not perish, we stayed. But whether we can be, uh, we can stay as a state or not is, is something we haven't proven yet. And the, 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 the answer is not very clear. It's, it's quite obscure now, given the situation uh, our people have at this moment. This is how we look at the state interest we are going through a very difficult period now. Most surely uh, the hardest, and there are thousands and maybe 10,000, maybe hundreds of thousands cases when people 
consider leaving the country, finding happiness elsewhere. And uh, I can tell you that is the case in Artsakh clearly. So this is an indicator that we may lose the state. So we may stay as an ethnic group, but we'll stop existing as a state because uh, frankly, apart from us, no one is interested in the existence of the state. So, I mean, uh, non-existence is, is maybe even better. I don't know, will be a lot of problems relieved. Turks, Azerbaijanis, or maybe someone else will take over. So, but apparently we are the only ones to take care of the state, but the first opinion is leave the country, trying to find some success elsewhere. Yeah, but meanwhile, we'd like to talk about powerful Armenia. Powerful Armenia can be built only in presence of those islands that I mentioned. And of course, there have to be very clear slogans, very clearly defined goals, perfectly understandable for everyone. You know, powerful Armenia. Okay, the Kazakhs, they adopted a law. It's, it's a it's a, something the state demands to have trilingual society. It's written everywhere. Every Kazakh has to know three languages. And the little languages are mentioned. The Kazakh language, Russian, and English. These are the languages. Now, we are definitely lagging behind Kazakhstan because we are a unilanguage society. We should focus on knowing four languages. I may say, if we want to have better conditions than the Kazakh society. Our neighbors, Georgians, they adopted a resolution to refrain from plastic packaging. No plastic. Zero plastic society is their goal. They're our neighbors. So they are concerned with their environment. Of course, that brings a lot of, a lot of difficulties for the businesses, for the society in general. I mean, it's, it's, it's very expensive to get rid of plastic, but Georgians decided to go that way and we didn't even think of it. By the way, issues of uh, the environment, the future are interconnected, yes, because the environment in Armenia is not well protected. So we have never been seriously concerned. We have never done anything, neither as a society nor as a state. We Yerevan is one of the most uh, littered, uh, polluted environments in the world. There are certain communities where waste is a serious problem. If we are born to die because of that, then uh, it's not the vision I'm talking about. And by the way, the nature retaliates in the most severe way. It says, if you don't love me, if you do not become part of me, then I'll retaliate. And it does retaliate. There is another threat. The HPP is built on rivers because most of the water flows through pipes these days. Well, HPPs were built because it was a quick source of money. Buildings were built in downtown Yerevan because they couldn't earn quick money. Hotels were built instead of forests because it was quick source of money. They uh, destroyed the forest, destroyed the rivers, so, because some people just managed to earn money. But what do we have in result? In result, it comes to prove that certain individuals managed to bring their interests above the national interests. So we lost in this battle because of that. That's why we lost, because we violate the law, because we don't like to obey the law, because we haven't developed standards, because we do not want to comply with those that we have developed. 
because we have cheated, uh, because we have deceived one another. When you go to a grocery store and buy dairy products, you have to be sure that it complies with the highest international standard if it's Armenian. Otherwise, there is no way. I mean, that's what we have to do, or at least it has to comply with what's written on the label. Yes, it's not enough. In that case, we won't be better than Azerbaijanis, Georgians, and others. We cannot compete for Armenia to get the chance to survive, not to exist and develop, but to attract to ensure inflow, not outflow of people. We have to be better than the others. We should not be okay on the label. There has to be the Armenian standard, which has to be the best in the world, but it's right to the opposite now. There are no Armenian tomatoes. We import tomatoes. We've lost the seeds. We decided to use the chemistry because we need volume, because someone needs money. But uh, but Azerbaijani tomatoes, for example, just to compare, is one of the best in quality in, in Russia. So Azerbaijanis got the, or had the brain not to spoil their agricultural produce, but we did. Remember, do you remember the tomatoes we had during the Soviet Union? Completely different, was it? Well, uh, by the time. Um, first month of my life passed in, in Great Britain and I, I understood I missed those tomatoes, yes. Yeah, but there are no proper tomatoes, it's just white inside now. Okay, unfortunately our time is limited and there are several questions I have received. By the way, part of these questions are apparently addressed to me, rather to me than to you. So uh, the first question, these Future Studios dialogues, are they about statehood uh, or about our past? Well, um, indeed, our, our talks are about statehood and are about the future. And it's clear that in order to be able to understand what future we want, and more importantly, how we want to build it, we need to understand what mistakes we have made or where we've been correct to reproduce those experiences. And that's why we come back to the past or the present, trying to justify it and to think about the future. The next is about the, ne uh, the, the same, I'm sorry, is about the next question. Can we stop discussing the three former regimes, talk about the 17 political parties, four regimes, why three? Four, already four, yes, we can say four already. So we have never conversed the former regimes, uh, 17 political parties and uh, treacherous government. We simply don't talk about that. Uh, because we talk about the future. So, questions to you now. Which are... Uh, well, no. Are there, or is there a possibility of having a unified state between Armenia, Russia, and Belarus. Well, to speak of that, we need to have very serious prerequisites. No one has ever said that uh, on any official platform. I don't even think that it may get any substance or it gets any substance today. I am a serious advocate of sovereign Armenia. I'm sure sovereign Armenia would be the best partner both for Russia and for Belarus and for the whole world. And uh, our relations uh, with the Russian Federation uh, in terms of being allies have to be raised to a higher level. Well, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult situation in the world now. And that everyone uh, understands that it's an extremely complicated situation we're facing now. 
So in such an extremely complicated situation, we don't have the right to play around kind of. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing some uh, inclinations to some geopolitical shifts and like Russia is not good, etc. I mean, we can simply sink here. On the contrary, we have to be able to take everything from the from such relations. And we can give the best to Russian Federation by being sovereign state, by defending our sovereign right, not by opposing it, but, but by defending it. Well, of course, uh, in, in terms of uh, defense, we have a lot to do together with Russia. And uh, I even think that in the future we must have, and with the highest probability we will have, joined military foes. I think that it's a necessity in the context of uh, geopolitical developments of today. By now, we haven't had the technological advantage. Well, of course, that's a compromising part of the sovereignty. No, I don't think so, because we're yet discussing defense. And uh, defense does not mean compromising statehood. If we speak of the assault in that case, we might compromise sovereignty, but we're talking about defense only in this phase. And we have to be able to deploy that to the extent possible and have it implemented. Meanwhile, using the potential of the uh, uh, great Armenian diaspora, we have to find ourselves uh, as a nation in in the Middle East, uh, rather than Caucasus, we're we're too confused. We are a Christian state, and that's how we have to position ourselves in the world. So, if we position ourselves that way in the world, for the world, then the significance of our sovereignty will definitely grow, especially for Russia, if we're able to once again reposition ourselves, to reposition ourselves, because ultimately we are an Eastern Christian state. Well, it's interesting that the first Armenian Republic essentially followed those principles in its existence of two years. Well, I might say to a certain extent, and uh, the historical opportunity that was given to us to cooperate with the states of the Middle East. So we have to once again find that opportunity and use it because in the Caucasian context, we don't have that opportunity. Okay, so by finding those and by using those links and opportunities, we should create new allies, find new allies. Well, uh, the number of allies can be unlimited, but see, Israel is an ally for the United States. It is a fundamental partner. Of course, they cooperate with many states, including Russia, but for the United States, they have a special role. And the role of the United States for Israel is also unique, exactly. So if we are able to find our role for Russia, proportionate to the one Israel has for the United States, we'll get the adequate response from Russia as well. There are many people conversing the role of Russia during the days of war. Well, we have to be interesting for Russia in the first place. Why should Russia become our ally in opposition to, uh, or in comparison to Russian Azerbaijan relations? Or why? What for? We must uh, naturally raise that question. So we haven't, and that's why we have the situation. So uh, yes, we have to find that uh, because we are a Christian, nation in the East, and we have to become one of the leaders in that connotation. Next question. Very general, I might say. 
how do you see the development of the educational system in the Republic of Armenia? Well, uh, first of all, the open universities, not schools. Okay, let's start from schools. Start with new kindergartens, national values, culture, basis. Reasonable, non-biased, non-pathetic, but important for the future type of education. The history books, they definitely failed in uh, complying with that mission. They don't discuss mistakes. They don't analyze the mistakes. There is no consistency. There, there are no uh, possibilities for rebirth of historical values. So, uh, yes, we feel the path as per se. Yes, and we have to reduce it. We have to reduce it, especially in the history books. But it's also very important to have this free universities, open universities present in the country. And uh, the most renowned thinkers of the world give a lot of importance to the role of uh, open universities in developing societies, in societies striving for development, universities that create the free thinking so I feel painful that uh, the universities uh, did not reach that level in Armenia. So uh, provided we didn't have these universities, which were to a certain extent free of pressure from the state, like the American university, for example, the French universities, so to a certain extent they're beyond uh, some state policies. If these were not there, we had definitely drowned for a long time ago. So because the rest of the universities, they are under the pressure from the state and now they have this law uh, and we have to forget about open universities in present of that law, which is very painful. It means that the authors of that law have no idea of statehood or they understand what statehood is and they deliberately want to destroy it. An open university is the foundation for a strong state. You should not be afraid of open universities. Very important. And the last question. They are just uh, sporadically emerging political questions. I do not want to ask. But the last question: In this arduous moment, we need your active involvement in the political life. Why do you avoid it? Before you answer it, even, I would like to say the following. We have very interesting society. Our society permanently strives to push more or less uh, famous people towards politics. I'm not sure that celebrities, more or less, should go into politics. I understand perfectly that if you don't do politics, then politics get to do things with you. So, uh, but I'm sure that there is still a need for a group of people in the society who are simply intelligent and interesting, but not politicians. You have the experience in politics. Will you really like to go back into it? Well, I'm a, I'm a free man. I want free life. I want to be, I do not want to be anyhow uh, limited by the rules of politics. So, but this is what it is. Do I want it or I don't? I want to live in a free country. I want to live in a country that develops. I want to live freely in, in, in a country where I can rely on the good future of my children. But uh, that's, that's not the country I am in at this moment. I will never leave Armenia. I don't want to work outside Armenia. I want to stay in Armenia. And when, in Ar when, when Armenia is in this situation, 
if there is no other way but going into politics, then I will do that. But it does not mean, well, you know, you should start doing things that you believe you can succeed in. in I, so I don't believe in parliamentary system. I always thought that it is timeless. Well, I mean, there's been not a single period in this 30 years when parliamentary system would do good, would be indicated for Armenia. It has always been counterindicated for the Republic of Armenia. So uh, I think we have the general obligation to participate. Was there? Yes. I mean, you should go into politics. And I'm not going to participate, but I'm sure a state, may, this state, will have future only in the presidential system. So if now we create some serious pressure on political powers of the country, uh, those that try to participate or will participate, we can apply pressure uh, so that they take the responsibility of uh, revising the constitution again and bringing the parliamentary, uh, the, the presidential system back. Uh, okay. Uh, there is one very important approach here. It is the society that demands, obliges to develop politics. Now, the politics create people or, or demand things from the people. So we, as the citizens of Armenia, we, what, what should we do? Should, should we demand the political, I mean, should we make the political parties ask for something or it's going the other way around? No, no. you see, Mark, we have raised several issues already. Approach to education, we can clearly formulate that. We can bring that demand up. So our attitude, our actions, our politics with the diaspora. Armenia as the Eastern Christianity, for the fortification of the statehood and cooperation with Russia uh, or an ally for Russia as Israelis for United States. These are clear, well visible theories there, there are so many prime ministers walking around in, in Armenia today. So you, you understand, right? People who do not have any vision, do not have any systemic approach to what has been has to be done. And uh, so, so that's why I think that we may apply very serious pressure and uh, demand the political powers to change the system back to presidential. And in that case, something may really change. Okay, and in conclusion, I'd like to mention the following. You said you would like to be a free man in a free society. Yes, well, I've reached the point that I can feel that freedom, but I'm, I'm simply enjoying it now. Okay, but freedom starts when you understand the rules. And uh, it cannot exist without responsibility. I sure, I'm sure you feel that responsibility as well. I would love to have the same feeling of responsibility, but this is also an issue pertaining to the society. In order to feel free, you have to be responsible. There's no other way. Doubtlessly, you're right. There has to be this collective responsibility. It's not that we're individually responsible for ourselves and our families. It's not even what we always do. But every person has to feel the responsibility collectively the responsibility for the society. Once again, we do not educate people for their success. We educate people for the success of the whole society because individual education ultimately makes no difference when the general society is illiterate. And it is, and that's the consequence of it. We can face today. All right. And in order to improve 
we have decided to hold these conversations, these dialogues. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is the rector of uh, Russian Armenia Slavonic University, former prime minister of the Republic of Armenia, Professor Armen Darpinian. Well, you, you should start from the other, the other end. You start from my position and then go to the title. You should start from the title. I mean, I do administrative work now as a rector of a university, but my, my work is being a professor, I lecture. That's what I do every Wednesday. It's a, it's, it's a big group of people uh, hearing my lectures. So, I mean, as, as a rector, I'm just an administrator. It's, that position doesn't matter. The, the, okay, my guest today is Professor Armin Darpinia. That's great, thank you very much, thank you. <laughs> 